Welcome. I'm Bill Leonard, Chair of the Department of Anthropology here at Northwestern. And I'd like to thank you all for coming out to this year's Jeremiah S. and Helen James Lecture on Assyrian Civilization and Culture. We are very pleased and honor, honored to have Professor Jeffrey Kahn from Cambridge tonight with us to share his research on the language of modern Assyrians. The James Lecture was established in 1999 by the late Helen James Schwarten, a prominent and active member of the Assyrian community. The lectureship was created to promote understanding and scholarship in both ancient and contemporary Assyrian culture. Mrs. Schwarten's gift to Northwestern was just one of the many ways that she expressed her commitment to the Assyrian community. She sponsored educational and cultural events for adults, endowed hundreds of college scholarships, formed a library and a museum, and helped countless immigrants establish new lives in America. She also was a long-standing board member of the Presbyterian Home and the McCormick Theological Seminary. As a young girl, Mrs. Schwarten fled with her family from Iran after three years wound up in the United States. As a devout Presbyterian, she met her first husband, Jeremiah James, in church. Mr. James, also an Assyrian immigrant, came to the United States as a teenager. In 1950, he founded J.S. James & Company, a building management firm, and later founded J.S. James and, and, excuse me, J, James Investment Company. He also served as trustee of the McCormick Theological Seminary and the Evans Scholar Foundation. The Jameses raised two sons, Edward and Kenneth, who followed in their parents' footsteps of philanthropy and devotion to the Assyrian community. We are very pleased to welcome them here this evening, along with their wives, Jeannie and Connie. We are most grateful to the Jameses for their support in helping bringing, help to bring distinguished scholars to this campus. Thank you very much. Our speaker for tonight is Jeffrey Kahn, professor of Semitic philology and chair of Asian and Middle Eastern studies at the University of Cambridge. Professor Kahn is a prolific scholar who has published numerous books and over a hundred research articles and book chapters. He received his PhD in 1984 from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He joined the faculty at Cambridge in 1993 and has held his current position as Professor of Semitic Philology since 2002. Jeffrey has published widely on linguistic studies of Biblical and Rabbinic Hebrew and is currently working as Editor-in-Chief on a massive five-volume encyclopedia of Hebrew language and linguistics. Professor Khan is also equally well known for his important scholarly contributions on Arabic and Aramaic. This fascinating work is documenting and preserving a record of modern Aramaic dialects that are now being rapidly lost. His publications include grammars of the dialects of the villages of Karkot and Barwar, and he is currently working on the grammar of the Assyrian Christian dialect of Urami. Since 2004, he has directed a research team that has created the Northeastern Neo-Aramaic Database, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the Newton Trust, and the Golden Web Foundation. Professor Khan has been widely recognized for his groundbreaking research. He was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 1998 and an honorary fellow of the Academy of Hebrew Language in 2011. In addition, in 2004, he was awarded the Lidzbarski Gold Medal for Semitic Philology. Professor Khan is also a member of the Cambridge Endangered Languages and Cultures Group and a board member of the Modern Assyrian Research Archive. His lecture for us tonight, The Language of Modern Assyrians and its Historical Background, addresses his recent work on documenting Neo-Aramaic dialects among communities in Turkey, Iran, and the Caucasus. 
please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Kahn. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very uh, warm introduction, and I'm, I feel very honoured to be invited to uh, deliver this lecture this evening. Uh, and I'd like to express my thanks to my hosts in Northwestern University and to the James family for their generous uh, um, donations which has made this lecture possible. I also would like to say how pleased I am to uh, meet uh, many of my old Assyrian friends and uh, have this opportunity to make new friends among the Assyrian community in Chicago, which I've always regarded as the Assyrian capital <laughs> of the United States. So, Shlama Lechun Kolechun, and Araba Chedyuin Chazin Lechun. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Assyrian Christians of the Middle East lived in thriving communities across a wide area encompassing northern Iraq, northwestern Iran, and southeastern Turkey. The momentous events that took place in the course of the century, however, brought about the destruction and displacement of a large number of these communities. The fateful event was the First World War, during which the Assyrians in the mountains of what is now southeastern Turkey sided with Russia against the Ottoman government. As a result, their villages were destroyed by the Turkish army and they were either massacred or driven from their homes. A large proportion of the survivors eventually settled far from their original villages in refugee camps in Iraq and Syria in the large cities such as Baghdad or Tehran, in the Caucasus or further afield in the West. In recent decades in Iraq, there has been further displacement of the Assyrian communities. In the late 1970s and early 80s, many of the numerous Assyrian villages in northern Iraq and southeastern Turkey were destroyed by the Iraqi and Turkish armies during Kurdish uprisings. These Assyrian communities had their own spoken language, which differed from the languages of the rest of the population in the area. This language has its roots in the Aramaic language and the language of the ancient Assyrians. One of the remarkable features of the language is its great diversity of dialects. Practically every Assyrian village spoke a different dialect. Although most of these village dialects were mutually, incomprehensi were mutually comprehensible, each one exhibited some features that were unique to it with regard to pronunciation, grammar, and lexicon. This impressive dialectal diversity of the language of the Assyrians is a rich cultural heritage. Tragically, as a result of all the devastating events of the last century, many of the vast network of Assyrian village dialects are now seriously endangered. It has been my mission over the last 20 years to attempt to salvage these endangered dialects from oblivion by undertaking fieldwork among Assyrian communities. I have done this by recording their speech and writing descriptions of their dialects. Most of my linguistic fieldwork has been carried out among Assyrian communities who have, who have been forced to leave their homeland in the Middle East and are now scattered around the world. I have visited Assyrian communities in England, France, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Italy, the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Armenia, Georgia, and Kazakhstan. The geographical reach of my travels reflects the truly worldwide dispersal of the Assyrian communities. 
Good speakers of many of the dialects that were originally spoken in Assyrian villages long since abandoned are increasingly difficult to find. The majority of such speakers are now considerably advanced in age and this has increased the difficulty of my fieldwork. And I'd just like to show you now a few um, photographs of some of, some of the uh, people I've interviewed on some of my travels to give you a flavor of some of my work. This is a, uh, a, 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 an old lady I, I was interviewing in a village called Kanda in uh, Georgia. Um, she, the, in the village of Kanda, is populated entirely by Assyrians whose origin is in uh, the plain of Urmi in, uh, western, in, in northwestern Iran. So I'm, um, I'll show you, this is, uh, just play a little audio clip of uh, her speaking. <laughs> Itwali Habruna, Hamda Janu, Bartu, Hamda Obrun, Bhava Judechulukta, Hacho, Chola, Twalo Beta Sura. Now, this, uh, sh this brings up another important point about my work is that although I am princ principally a linguist, I do a lot of recording of the older members of the community telling all kinds of stories because with the, the death of or the, the gradual endangerment of, of a lot of the village dialects also endangered uh, is a very rich folklore and particularly uh, a, fo a, a tradition of folk tales which have been told for generations but which are now extremely endangered. This uh, gentleman here is one of the fi final speakers of a, lang of a dialect uh, which originated in eastern Turkey but he, I found him in a village in Armenia and uh, here, here, here is Yes, he, this was the beginning of, a, of an epic um, which uh, really is very difficult to, m very few people now remember this epic story of, of Kotine, it's called, uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to find him uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in Armenia. And um, here is some uh, photographs of villages which have now been destroyed in uh, southeastern Turkey in the region of Judi. This is uh, the, the village of Ishi uh, in, in Judi, and some of showing some of the inhabitants uh, showing their traditional life. All this has now disappeared. Uh, in the 1970s, these villages were abandoned. And, um, and this is, uh, just to give you a clip of this man from, he's from Harbole. Um, <laughs> Etwala parche parche at skara, etwala naula, etwala dapta, etwala manaur, etwala fukaniye, etwala tahteniye, and not a little guba, what lawyer and a labaruska. Yeah, he was just describing the a, um, a weaving device, a loom, uh, how the, in this village most of the men were weavers, and he was describing his guba, which is a, a, a a loom which is uh, constructed on, on in the ground. Despite the difficult conditions of my work, I've always been warmly welcomed by the Assyrian communities. In some cases, I've met elderly people who are among the final surviving speakers of a dialect. They are generally aware of the fact that they are the last carriers of the linguistic tradition of their communities and very much want somebody to preserve this before it is too late. I have had many emotional experiences in my fieldwork, especially when I, have, when I have met elderly members of the communities who are among the final speakers of their dialect. One of the most moving experiences I have had was in Tbilisi in Georgia 
Many Assyrians moved to the Caucasus region, mainly Georgia and Armenia, in the 19th century and early 20th century from eastern Turkey and northwestern Iran. These included Assyrians from Urmi and Salamas in Iran and from Van and other regions in eastern Turkey. I traveled to Georgia three years ago in order to record the speech of Assyrians from Van and Salamas. I had had difficulty finding good speakers from these communities who were able to speak the dialects in their original pure form. I had previously met some speakers who originated in Salamas, but their speech was mixed with that of other dialects, especially the dialect of Urmi. In Tbilisi, I was told that there was one elderly woman from Salamas in her 90s who still spoke a pure form of the Salamas dialect. I was taken to a large Soviet-style block of apartments and led down an endless series of dark, narrow corridors. Finally, I knocked on the door of an apartment and a small, frail woman welcomed me into her home. We sat together at a table. I was nervous that she may be exhausted by my visit and my questions. She took hold of my wrist with her small, frail hand and said, Ask everything you want to know. Ask. Bikor, Bikor, she said in her dialect. She held on to me for over two hours and kept on urging me to ask her questions. She said she wanted me to preserve her language because she knew it would be lost in her family and in her community when she died. The earliest field workers on the dialects of the Assyrians worked at a period before the major displacement of the communities from their homes in the Middle East. It was in the 19th century that scholarly linguistic description began to be carried out. Already in the middle of the 18th century, Karsten Niebuhr reported the existence of the language in the north of Iraq and collected some basic data. But the scholarly community of Europe was slow in showing an interest in this. Some of the first serious fieldwork on the spoken dialects was carried out by missionaries. In 1855, a description of the dialect spoken by Assyrians in Urmi in northwestern Iran was published by D.T. Stoddard, who was a member of the Presbyterian mission to the town. In 1895, A.J. McLean, the head of the Anglican mission in Urmi, published a book to which he gave the title Grammar of Vernacular Syriac. This was based on first-hand fieldwork on numerous Assyrian dialects spoken across the dialect area. Other grammatical descriptions made before the First World War, based on direct contact with speakers of the dialects in the region, include those of Sotsin, Duval, Sachau, and Retore. The important grammar of Theodor Nerdicke, Grammatik der Neusyrischen Sprache an Omiase, published in 1868, was based on Stoddard's grammar of Urmi, and text produced in a written form of the dialect that was developed in the 19th century, rather than directly on contact with native speakers in situ. This flourishing linguistic activity came to an end with the First World War, and concerted research did not resume until the middle of the 20th century, after the aforementioned dislocations in the Assyrian communities had taken place. The Georgian scholar Constantine Saratelli made numerous important contributions from the 1950s onwards, especially concerning the dialects of the Urmi region. In the last two decades, there has been an upsurge in research, but in spite of this, numerous dialects spoken by the Assyrians still remain without any description at all, and there is currently a race to salvage for scholarship as many of these as possible before their final speakers pass away. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the 20th century, before the dislocations, most of the dialects of the Assyrian, Assyrian Christians 
was spoken in an area that can be defined roughly as the region lying to the north of a line drawn diagonally across a map connecting Mosul and Kirkuk. The northwestern boundary is the river Tigris. The northern boundary of the linguistic area was Lake Van in Turkey and um, Salamas in Iran. The eastern boundary was constituted by towns in western Iran, such as Urmi and Sanandaj. The modern Assyrian language spoken by Assyrians from the Tigris up to the Caucasus is ultimately descended from a variety of the Aramaic language that was spoken in the region of Mesopotamia in antiquity. The closest relatives of the dialects spoken by the modern Assyrians are a series of vernacular Aramaic dialects that were spoken by Jewish communities in Iraq, southeastern Turkey, and western Iran until the 1950s. In 1951, all the Jews left the region. The next closest relative is the, is the, is the group of dialects spoken by the Christian communities of Tur Abdin in, south, in southern Turkey, west of the Tigris. More distant relatives are Aramaic vernaculars spoken in the villages of Ma'lula, Bacha, and Jubadin in the region of Damascus in Syria, and those spoken by the Mandeans in Ahvaz and Khurram Shahar in western Iran. Some of the dialects spoken by the Assyrians in the region of the Tigris, such as the dialects of Bohtan and the village of Hassan, some of these dialects exhibit a greater affinity to the dialects of Tur Abdin than other Assyrian dialects. One feature distinguishing the Assyrian dialects of Iraq and Iran from the dialects of Tur Abdin, for example, is the shift of a long A vowel to O. So in most dialects uh, east of the Tigris, one would say Shlama when greeting somebody, whereas in the region of Tur Abdin to the west of the Tigris, one would say Shlomo. In the dialect of Bohtan, however, the greeting would be Shloma, between Shlam and Shlomo. <laughs> the Muslims of the area speak different languages. Throughout most, of, uh, most regions of Iraq and Turkey, where the Assyrian villages are located, as well as in the Iranian region, south of the environs of Urmi, the Muslims speak Kurdish. In the region of Urmi up to Salamas in the north, Azeri Turkish is the dominant Muslim language. Neither of these Muslim languages is related to the Semitic languages of the Assyrians and the Jews of the area. As I have remarked, there is considerable diversity among the Assyrian dialects. By way of illustration of this linguistic diversity, we may take, take a look at the forms for the word house in the selection of dialects. So here we have a, um, a list of just a selection of dialects of see how they pronounce the word house. Now, originally that word house was pronounced like this, bythar, and uh, we, these are all the ways in which the different Assyrian villages pronounce this word. Now, there is a village called Gramun, which is actually was originally in Lower Tiari in southeastern Turkey, which actually preserves the form almost intact, Baitha. But many other dialects, various changes happen, like in Enune, which is in northern Iraq, in Barwar, they say Betha. In Zaho, you would hear a form Beta. Uh, Urmi, they say Beta. Akra, Besa some of the regions, uh, villages around Akra in Iraq, Opatiare, like Mune Martha, they would say Besha. Uh, in Baz, the Mahayir, in, in eastern Turkey, would say Beya, and in Jilu, Bia. This diverse group of dialects can be, diver can be divided into, vi into various subgroups according to the varying degrees of linguistic innovation which is the accepted method of language classification. In general, the dialects spoken in the villages on the plain of Mosul tend to be more archaic in structure than the other dialects. 
The dialect of, of the village of Karakosh, lying on the Mosul plain at the southern periphery of the dialect area, is one of the most archaizing of the dialects. One of the archaic features of these dialects, uh, for example, is the occurrence of a d or the element in the demonstrative pronoun this, which has early roots, the, the d element in the, in the word for this. In most other dialects, this has disappeared, and the, 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 the demonstrative pronoun this is formed by analogy with the form of the demonstrative pronoun that. Now, I try to show you this here, to show you that in Karakosh, this house would be Ada Betha, and that house, Au Betha. Whereas in Borua, you say Awa Betha, and that house, Au Betha. So the point is that this the here, although it might seem a little a trivial fact, it is a very old feature, which is specific to the, the, the dialects in the region of, uh, of, of the Mosul Plain. Some of the most innovative dialects are those that were originally spoken in the northeastern periphery in eastern Turkey, in the regions of Baz, Jilu, and Van. In these dialects, for example, drop the letter T in many contexts. Assyrians from the Baz village of Aruntus, which is in eastern Turkey, as I showed, Assyrians from the Baz village of Aruntus, the Artusnaye or Artusne, as they call themselves, would say for a new house, they would say, Biachaiha. Whereas uh, in Ulmi, for example, you would say, Betachata which should preserve the original T. In the northeast of Iraq, there was an Assyrian community in a small village known as Bidyal, which was isolated in a mountainous region. Very few, very few speakers of this dialect are alive today. This is Bidyal. I found one of the last speakers in Auckland, New Zealand a few years ago. Due to its isolation in the mountains, the speech of the Assyrians of Bidyal is quite different from other dialects. It includes some archaic features that are not found in other dialects of northeastern Iraq and eastern Turkey. But before I, I let me just play a little bit of a speech from Bidyal. Um, <laughs> Yes, now, probably not many people understand that, except for Khasha Gwirgis, <laughs> who's from Bidjil. Um, but uh, the, um, the, this is an extremely archaic dialect in many respects, but since it's been very isolated in the mountains, it's become very different from other dialects. Now, for example, in this dialect, the demonstrative pronoun this is acha. So acha beta is this house. And this actual ch derives originally as a sort of palatalized form of d. So it, we, it comes from a form adda or ada. And this is, this, is, this, this is the archaic d in the demonstrative word for this, which I have been describing, which only survives in this area, in the, in the uh, north eastern periphery in the Bidjil dialect. Um, now, many forms, despite some of this, this, uh, this archaizing in the Bidjil dialect, many forms are, are very innovative and will seem strange to most Assyrians. Uh, and here are some more examples. For example, in Bidjil you'd say something like La Ichele, he has come, which would be equivalent to in Urmi Tiele. Makicha, she is coming, which is equivalent to Bitaile or in Urmi or Thayela in Barwar. Um, La Lacha, Dule Lacha, Hole Lacha. Kamanji Makizit, why are you going? Which is equivalent to Kamu or Kamodi Zalawit. In uh, more familiar, more uh, it's a dialect which would be more familiar to you, perhaps. 
A large proportion of the Assyrians were agriculturalists, residing in scores of, of small villages across the region. In the modern period, some Assyrians resided in large, for example, the word Bachshime denotes a storeroom for grain in the roof of a house. It is reasonably certain that this is a descendant of the Akkadian term Bit Hashimi, which is, was a barn or storehouse. Another possible example in this dialect is Rochisa, which is a, means a pile of straw, or usually barley, which could, be, which, which could well be related to Akkadian Rachitsu, which is a pile of harvest produce. The word for an external door or gate uh, of, of a house in, uh, in the Karakosh dialect is Billa, which is likely to be derived ultimately from Akkadian Abulum, meaning a city gate. In several dialects spoken in northern Iraq, including those of the Sapna Valley, Borwar and the surrounding region, rice was grown in a paddy field uh, or paddy field basins which were referred to in the village dialects as Mishare. So a Mishara was a paddy, a paddy field basin for growing rice. This can be traced, it seems, to the Cadian word Musharu. As I, as I have remarked, this Akkadian lexical component is a distinctive feature of the Assyrian dialects, and most of it is unique to these dialects. Its existence demonstrates that the spoken dialects must have their roots in ancient vernacular forms of Aramaic, which were in contact with Akkadian when the latter language was still spoken in the Mesopotamian region. Language contact arises through bilingualism, and so the Akkadian lexical items must have entered the Aramaic vernaculars in communities who spoke both Akkadian and Aramaic. This must have taken place at a period when Akkadian was still a spoken language in the first millennium BC. As I have remarked, the closest relative of the language of the modern Assyrians is the language spoken by their Jewish neighbors in northern Iraq and western Iran. This also has its historical roots in Aramaic of earlier periods and exists in numerous different dialects. In all cases, however, these Jewish dialects differ from the speech of the Assyrian communities in the same geographical area. Most of the Jews of the region lived in the towns and worked as traders. In several cases, Assyrians and Jews inhabited the same town but spoke related but very different and in many cases mutually incomprehensible dialects. This applied, for example, to the communities of Zaho, Koisanjak in Iraq, and Sulaymaniya in Iraq, and also Salamas and Urmi and Sanandaj in Iran. I'll give you here some examples from the um, Urmi uh, dialect. In the, the Syrians of Urmi, for example, as we see, would, for the word for house, they would say beta. Uh, whereas the Jews of Ormi would say bela. The, the Syrians of Ormi would say toyura, for mountain. The, uh, the Jews uh, would say tura. Um, sura, small, zora, Jews. Brunu, his son, bronev, the Jews would say. Spinavin. I am hungry, Kpinailen, the Jews would say. Bishtaile, he's drinking, the Syrians would say. Shatoe, the Jews would say. Hamzumile, he is speaking. Maroe, he is speaking. Shlila, he stopped. Smuchle, the Jews would say. Buslaile, he was coming down. Kvashe, the Jews would say. Now, just to give you an example of the different speech, this is Urmi Christian, uh, or uh, Syrian. Itva dant kadim yamare itva litva itva khadan melcha sanchiro melchev tatrayeva 
و اخی کار خشی به مارونه خشی میان لیپه رابه چون دنیا طاوله و اخی کار چیز بابت ملچز پلیخه و چیز بابو دویده و وزریت و وزر این یال هلت فعله. Okay, that's the beginning of a story for about a chikar which I recorded in Australia from a Syrian uh, lady. Now this is a somebody, a Jewish uh, gentleman from Ormi. It was let for Khashultana. Ya Shultana at Fale Khanan Kabrata. Al Barate Raba Gibala. Raba Raba Gibala. Well, it's very different dialect and it's very difficult to understand, I think, if you are a Syrian from Ormi. As can be seen, there are substantial differences between these two dialects in phonology, morphology, and lexicon. The Jewish dialect of Ormi was, in fact, much more closely related in structure to other Jewish dialects spoken in towns situated at considerable geographical distances from Ormi, such as Arbil in Iraq, than to the Assyrian dialect spoken in the same town. This communal dialectal cleavage has apparently been brought about by different migration histories of the two religious communities and serves as a source for the reconstruction of the historical background of the communities, like the typology of artifacts in archaeological excavations. It also reflects the fact that social proximity has been a more powerful force in the formation of the dialects than geographical proximity. The Jewish dialects can be divided into two main subgroups, which in broad terms are divided by the great Zab River. Dialects that were spoken to the south and east of the great Zab River, which are now known among scholars as the trans-Zab subgroup of dialects, exhibit a variety of shared innovative features that are not found in the dialects spoken to the north of the river, which may be termed the northwestern subgroup. So the dialects north of the Zab in places like Amid, this is the Jewish dialects in Amedia, Dohok and Zachor, for example, are very different from the dialects in this area here, all the way, any, any dialect uh, east of the Zab. Um, So, um, the main Jewish dialect speaking, uh, the main Jewish communities speaking dialects belonging to the Trans-Zab subgroup were found in the Iranian towns of Salamas, Urmi, uh, Solduz, Shinos, Mahabad, Bokan, Sakas, Sanandaj, Kerend, and in the Iraqi towns of Sulaymaniyah, Halabja, Hanakin, Rustaka, Kaladeze, Koysenjak, Rwandus and also in the villages of the Arabil Plain. The main Jewish community speaking dialects in the northwestern subgroup, north of the Zab, were found in Iraq in the towns of Zaho, Amedia, and Dohok, with small communities in the villages of Beta Nure, Nerwa, and over the border in southeastern Turkey, the village of Challa. One of the most conspicuous features of the Trans-Zab subgroup of Jewish dialects that distinguishes it from the northwestern subgroup and indeed from all of the Syrian dialects, is the shift of interdental consonants th to the lateral l. So, whereas the Jews of Dohok would say betha for house, the Jews of Sulaymaniyah across the Zab would say bela. Just as the Akkadian lexical component is a distinctive feature of the Assyrian dialects, a distinctive feature of the lexicon of the Jewish dialects is a Hebrew component. This includes numerous Hebrew words relating to Jewish ritual and tradition that have entered the everyday spoken vernaculars. Many Jewish languages have such a Hebrew component. It is found, for example, also in Jewish Arabic dialects, Ladino and Yiddish. Its origins can be traced in part to Hebrew reading traditions of liturgy and traditional texts, but it is possible that some of it has its roots in spoken forms of Hebrew of earlier periods. This is reflected by the fact that the form of Hebrew words appearing in the Hebrew component of Jewish languages sometimes differs from the form they have in the liturgical reading traditions. These lexical components, the Akkadian component of the Assyrian dialects on the one hand and the Hebrew component of the Jewish dialects on the other hand, are important evidence for reconstructing the historical background of the dialects. In the modern Assyrian dialects, the subject of a past perfective verb is expressed by a series of uh, suffixes containing the pre prepositional 
preposition L. Now, I'll just, just finally, I want to show you one, um, some a bit, uh, I need to do, show you a little bit more about uh, grammar just to show you um, something very important. Um, so, in, um, the, in, in Assyrian dialects, you would say uh, things like Grishli, I have pulled, Timle, he, he rose. Whereas in um, literary Syriac, these forms of uh, expressing the subject don't exist. You use other forms such as grash, gersheth. Uh, you don't express the subject with these, uh, pr this prepositional L, this sort of so-called L suffix. Now, the, the point is that this uh, L suffix is actually, although it does not occur in classical Syriac, it is not, it's nothing new. It actually is already found in, in some uh, very early Aramaic texts datable to the 5th century BC, such as I have an example here from a document of the 5th century BC, from Shmi'ali. The, um, the construction is sporadically attested in Syriac. For example, you hear th in Syriac you occasionally find th examples such as Krenlach Kethawe, have you read the books which in which the subject of the sentence Lach is expressed by this L construction, but this is very rare. Uh, in, uh, in Syriac, the, the past form is far more frequently expressed by verbs with the form gr with the form grash, uh, gersheth, without the, uh, the without the L expressing the subject. These the sporadic examples of past forms in Syriac with the subject expressed by the preposition L are likely to be reflections of the contemporary spoken vernacular that have infiltrated the standard literary language. It appears that this feature existed from a very early period in the spoken vernacular dialects, but was for the most part concealed by the standard literary forms of Aramaic, such as Syriac. I've, I have already drawn attention to, attention to the fact that some of the modern spoken dialects exhibits more, exhibit morphology that is typologically more archaic than that of classical Syriac. The example I gave was the infinitive form of, the, of one of the um, verbal conjugations in the dialect of Karakosh, whereby the um, infinitive of Karakosh lacks the M here, whereas Syriac has the M. The, as I said, the, in Syriac, the M appears to have been innovation, uh, whereas Karakosh has preserved the original form. Another way in which the morphology of the infinitive forms uh, differ from Syriac in the modern Assyrian dialects is in their vowel pattern. For example, in most dialects, there, um, there is the vowel O in the infinitive of the, some of the uh, verbal conjugations whereas this is not, uh, uh, is not found in Syriac. This feature of the modern dialects, which distinguishes them from literary Syriac, may have developed in antiquity due to contact with Akkadian, since Akkadian, especially the northern Assyrian dialect of Akkadian, has similar vowel patterns in infinitives. So, in many Assyrian dialects you would say for the, the katole or garoshe or um, uh, shadore, you would have this all vowel, whereas in, in, in literary Syriac, it has a completely different form of infinitive, but this looks very much like Akkadian vowel pattern, parusu. This is a different verb, but you can see the, the, this is the ancient Assyrian form of the infinitive in uh, Akkadian, which looks, has a similarity. Uh, the, um, the modern Assyrian dialects have been extensively influenced, however, by the Iranian languages of the region, especially Kurdish. This is evident in the high proportion of lexical borrowings from Kurdish. It should be noted that the Jewish dialects, especially those spoken east of the Zab, contain a higher proportion of Kurdish loans than the Assyrian dialects. In some Jewish dialects, up to 65% of the nouns are loans from Kurdish. This may be the result of the fact that the Jews were urban mercantile communities with more intensive contact with the Kurdish population whereas the Assyrians were predominantly agricultural communities living in villages separated from the Kurds. We do not always encounter a straightforward transfer of linguistic material from Kurdish to the Assyrian dialects. 
In some cases, the Assyrian dialects mold native linguistic material into the shape of words um, and forms that are found in Kurdish rather, rather than directly borrowing material from Kurdish. A particularly striking case of such phonetic convergence is found in the forms of the demonstrative pronouns in some Assyrian dialects in Iraq. In the dialects of the Barwa region, for example, demonstrative pronouns are found that are virtually identical phonetically to equivalent pronouns in the Kurdish dialects of neighboring Kurdish villages. Though the former, that is to say the Assyrian dialects, have a Semitic etymology, and the latter Iranian. So in Barwa, this would be Awa, and Kurds would say Awa. Aw, that, the same. In Kurdish, awaha, awehe. So, to very similar sounding w words, but they've simply converged. They're, they're not, one is not borrowing from the other. If this similarity was found in two languages of, of uncertain genealogy and with no historical records from earlier periods, it could well be interpreted as reflecting a genetic connection between the languages, or at least the transfer of morphological material from one language to another. This is a fascinating case of convergence of linguistic forms to a language spoken in the surrounding environment in the more recent history of the spoken Assyrian dialects. The forms of the infinitive that are found in the modern Assyrian dialects, which I've just mentioned, and their resemblance to Akkadian, can be regarded as a result of a similar convergence at a much more ancient period. Such linguistic convergence must have arisen through bilingualism, indicating that the speakers of the ancestors of the modern Assyrian dialects in the ancient period must have spoken Akkadian, just as the modern Assyrians of Iraq are generally bilingual in Assyrian and Kurdish. To sum up, the spoken Assyrian dialects are a remarkable heritage with considerable historical depth having roots in the period of the ancient Assyrians, with a history that is independent of that of Syriac and other literary forms of Aramaic. They are a rich and unique legacy from the past that survives to this day in the modern Assyrian communities. They should, in my opinion, be treasured by the modern Assyrians as much as the ancient stone monuments of the Assyrians. Indeed, I passionately be believe that the spoken Assyrian dialect should be treasured even more than the ancient heritage of statues and buildings, since statues and buildings will remain for generations to come. But many of the spoken dialects, with their fascinating diversity and vestiges of ancient linguistic forms, such as their Akkadian component, are now in serious danger of being lost and falling into oblivion. It is, it is for this reason that I have applied myself unrelentingly over the last two decades to record and describe the spoken Assyrian dialects. This, I believe, is currently one of the most important and urgent tasks in the field of Semitic linguistics. Thank you. Professor Khan, thank you for a tremendous and really informative lecture. It's a great pleasure to see such a tremendous turnout from the Chicago area Syrian community tonight. I hope you'd be willing to take a, sure. a few questions sure. from that community that you know so well. Sure. Sure. Akkadian language existed uh, mostly in, uh, in Babylonian dialect and the uh, Assyrian dialect. Can we consider that the vernacular language that it existed in Hakkari region, Urmia region, even Assyrian languages of, of uh, Aramaic who are interested in speaking with these surviving speakers, uh, even though they may live continents away? Mm. Um, well, yes, Skype and mass communication, obviously, in many respects, has, has, is a great boon. I myself have sometimes spoken to people, uh, people around the world on Skype, 
Um, just just a few days ago, I was Skyping somebody in Kazakhstan, uh, some Assyrian. <laughs> but on the other hand, it, it doesn't always um, mass can well the two answers to your question the mass communication can also be dangerous for the survival of the rich diversity of dialects for example um, I mean when lots of people from different villages come together in one place their dialect gets leveled this is what happened in many cases in the, the history of this, the modern Assyrians I mean after the First World War particularly uh, after the tragedy of in the um, and the Hakari, for example, all the tribe, all the dialects of the villages of the Hakari came together and mixed the Urmi, and they basically mixed together and formed a sort of Koine common language. And a lot of the features of the original vi village dialects were lost. And so, mass communication, when Assyrians from different villages communicate, is obviously a very good thing, for communication, but it does bring about dialectal leveling. And the second thing, uh, other sort of answer I'd give you was that, uh, you know, some of the most precious speakers of the dialects are very, very old, and they um, certainly they would not be the sort of sitting down at uh, with a PC in front of them. You know, this um, uh, this village here in Bidjil, for example. I mean, uh, um, and the man I, you know, I was playing a recording of. He was an extremely old man who. Um, is, he is one of the most, tre you know, he is one of the treasures, the people I'm really, really sort of um, trying to uh, meet, but um, somehow you have to just go and see them and interview them. It's very difficult to, uh, to Skype them. <laughs> right. Right. So. It's really interesting what, what you're saying about the, 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 almost the lack of any kind of Akkadian roots in, 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 in written Syriac. And does, if I'm understanding you right, does, does that suggest that Syriac as a written language would first have been written down in an area outside of a place mm. with deep Akkadian mm. antecedents? Well, I mean, the, that's certainly the case that um, it's normally thought that the, the literary language of Syriac began life in um, uh, Edessa, which in, in, in Turkey, which is sort of off. Well, I mean, Akkadian at some point would have been used as a literary form of language there, though it's, it's not clear whether it was actually ever spoken. Um, so that might be one explanation. The other, other explanation is that, in fact, the Syri the Many, most of these, Akkad, this so -called, what I'm calling the Akkadian component of, of the modern Assyrian dialects, most of this is found in the language of agriculture, in the mouths of farmers in the villages. And I've, I've found these, because when I do my fieldwork, I, I, I'm particularly interested in um, gathering words connected with agriculture, because all the, the villages were... Um, most of the villages had this very rich vocabulary of agriculture because everybody worked on the land. So it asked people all about the names of the different parts of a plough, for example. I mean, I, when I could tell you all the different names of the different parts of a plough in, in Barwar, for example. Uh, but the point is, in literary documents, like in I don't know, theological this, debates or whatever, there's very, uh, in, which you'd find in Syriac, there's probably very little... Uh, um, context for, for referring to certain agricultural sort of details or details of agricultural products or, or agricultural implements. So that might be another reason why some of this vocabulary has not survived in the literary language. But it, this is why it's important, um, these sort of vernacular language of the agricultural communities, they're sort of, these totally, you know, these, these, these people who work on the land who are not literary scholars uh, it is in their mouths that there that, 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 that has been preserved this, this ancient linguistic heritage. <laughs>